Okay, there's going to be a review of the Kurt Angle A&E documentary that aired this week. Uh, WWE Legends Biography, I believe that's the exact title of it. But, you know, I'll be honest with you, I was a little bit disappointed that the Angle documentary was going to be part of this A&E uh, series. I just thought, um, with Kurt Angle in particular, I thought he deserved... Um, you know, a documentary on the same level as like The Last Dance or what we're seeing right now with the Derek Jeter, the captain uh, documentary on ESPN. I just felt like this should have been a multi-part documentary, maybe air it on the WWE Network and then maybe give it a Blu-ray release at the same time, along with an anthology. I would have paid like 50 bucks for that if they actually did release it um, because, you know, Kurt Angle, uh, very inspirational uh, because he was a legit amateur wrestler and made the transition. Uh, you know, pretty much better than anybody with, uh, you know, the work that he did in the WWE. From my personal taste, maybe the most inspirational wrestler ever. I wouldn't say that Angle is the greatest of all time. I would say that Brett is the greatest of all time in terms of the WWE. And Chris Benoit would actually be my pick for, you know, greatest overall wrestler of all time. But I, I do feel like Angle is probably my pick for the guy that probably inspired me the most in terms of uh, professional wrestling so he does mean a lot to me but yeah i mean the, the two the two negatives about the documentary is tna they they uh they totally tried to downplay tna and act like it was below wwe and um you know, they talked about how angle was very complacent there mixing the pills and the drugs and and the drinking so I, I didn't like the fact that they were so negative about uh, TNA. And the other thing is, you know, just the end of it, it just came off very depressing. It's just like, it, it just feels like in order to sell these documentaries, we have to overly dramatize uh, the pill addiction and the drug addiction. And, you know, we, we like to, just to appeal to the masses, we have to, we have to promote the negativity of this man's wonderful career, and it, it, it totally overshadows all the good stuff that he did. So I don't know. I, I just feel like WWE could have done a, 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 a documentary on a major level and, you know, maybe just, you know, giving this thing a lot more um, of a spotlight, you know, just highlighting the positive stuff. But um, but overall, I, I got to say the documentary really did stick with me. I was blown away by some of the footage uh, that they were able to show from the amateur wrestling days, from the Olympics, from the the world championships. I mean, th that was definitely I mean, it motivated the shit out of me just seeing, you know, angle training when he was young. And, um, you know, just just, you know, the, we finally get to see the footage of him, uh, you know, breaking his neck at the Olympic trials. So, so you just you saw a lot of just really. I would say, you know, rare footage, valuable footage. And uh, overall, I, I, I was pleasantly surprised with the pre-WWE stuff. A lot of the WWE stuff is very well documented. But I don't know, just what by the time you got to the TNA stuff, it, it just felt like they were harping. Uh, it, 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 actually, it, it actually made it feel, you know, worse than ever, like with Angle's, uh, you know, drug addiction. But at the same time, you got to give Angle credit for being very honest and very open with, um, you know, everything that he did talk about. Like, like we all knew it was bad, but did you really know it was that bad where Angle was actually had, uh, you know, was getting the prescriptions from a regular doctor. And then at the same time, he was getting them from a Mexican drug dealer as well. So that that kind of, you know, gave this whole, you know, downfall you know, kind of, uh, you kind of looked at it at a, at, in, in a different way. Uh, I would definitely say that. But, but yeah, let's just uh, go through this. They start off talking about how Angle's father actually, uh, you know, was killed in a um, crane accident. He was actually a crane operator, and he actually died in a uh, construction accident, accident where he actually broke his skull. Uh, it's just a very, um, you know, depressing story. Uh, they, they talked about how his sister you know, like, you know, just, just jumped on top of the father when, when they, when they pulled the plug. And I mean, his father only died at 16 years old. I mean, it's just, just a, a tragic story. And, um, but they, they, they really went into the depth about how strict the father was. Uh, he wouldn't hug any of the Angle boys and he would only hug the sister. So yeah, you just, um, I think it was Eric Angle talked about how solid of a dude, uh, you know, Kurt Angle's father was. And, you know, we, we've learned, we've known this stuff from Angle's book about how, 
um, his father's death really had a huge impact on his life because he would always be thinking, you know, what what would my father think if I took a day off or, you know, didn't train as hard as possible? Um, so this kind of started this trend of whenever there be a, a death in the family, uh, he would always, you know, tribute the next game or the next match to the family member that passed away, which I think is good. I mean, some people could misinterpret it, it as you not caring. Um, but I think it's, you know, very admirable, very, it's, it's the tougher thing to do to actually go out there and just dedicate, you know, a performance just to one person. And sometimes it does pay off. And he talked about this football game where he said it was flawless. It was beyond epic how he was a fullback. He had, you know, two touchdowns. He had an interception. He, he described it as the perfect game. The footage from that game isn't great. It, it looks a little bit dated. It's hard to even, you know, tell that that was Angle out there uh, playing fullback. But, you know, you learn about how football was his first love. Eventually he did try out for the Steelers um I believe it was after the Olympics and it just it just didn't work out but then the transition to becoming a great amateur wrestler happened and you know his, his coaches told and you know if they did a major angle documentary I like to hear about the specifics of you know how he improved his technique or what made him such a great amateur wrestler from from the actual coaches you heard a little of it but I just I would like to see it be even more in depth because I found the amateur wrestling stuff uh very fascinating and I'll talk about it in a second, but yeah, you know, when he was a wrestler in high school at uh, Matt LeBannon, he actually won the junior nationals, uh, was be, became state champion. The coaches actually just told him, like, you have a chance to be like the best wrestler to ever come from this high school. And then after that, he just took his training to another level. Then he went to Clarion University. They had great footage of the NCAA championship. That's one of the rare things that would actually get television ratings, especially back in the early 90s, um, the NCAA championship. CBS actually uh, had a television deal with them. So, yeah, there was huge money in that. But obviously, you know, the wrestlers weren't getting paid for that. But um, it's just a shame that a lot of the amateur wrestlers just, you know, um, you know, just don't make a lot of money. There's just no money involved, you know, after the Olympics. There's, it's not like the NBA or, or baseball where there's huge television contracts. It's not like you, you could draw people to come and see you every single night. So it's depressing, man, because, um, you know, there's... They didn't talk about it here, but in the Foxcatcher documentary for ESPN, they talked about how Dave Schultz's brother, I think it was Mark Schultz, who won the gold medal in 84. And then like a couple years later, he was just broke. And it wasn't until John DuPont gave him a job that he was finally you know, able to to make a little bit of money as, as a trainer. So it, it's sad. It's like you win a gold medal and then it's, it's either you're broke or you become you know, somewhat of a coach. So it, it really is. I mean, I've always found that very fascinating how, you know, amateur wrestler, you could argue is probably the most difficult sport. You know, they got to be the well, best conditioned athletes, but like, where do you go after you reach the pinnacle of that career? Um, and then they showed the 1995 world championships and, you know, angle was just a, a machine at that time. You know, he just, he was, they showed a lot of the training. His mom even said that, you know, you know, angle lived with the mom at the time, but like he she would never see him like he would come home get something to eat get something to drink and then just go back out and train it was relentless it was he was training so hard that they had to keep an eye on him because they thought he was going to overtrain and just die i mean it's crazy i mean they showed angle doing a lot of jump rope a lot of uh a lot of crunches a lot of ab work um so he did win the world championships in 1995 um, and, and it's funny, they, there's a lot of footage. There was footage after his dad passed away. There's even a couple interviews after some of these big, um, you know, wrestling meets. And he just he just comes off like a, you know, typical jock. He didn't really have his voice was very different at the time. But he didn't really have a ton of charisma, but you could definitely tell like he had some sort of uh, innocence about him. And it, it's almost like. And I never thought of it before, but like the same versatility that he had in pro wrestling where he wasn't afraid to make fun of himself, wasn't afraid to make a fool out of himself. Even the Jay Leno clip, it, it, it kind of ties into, you know, the versatility in the WWE. And I never thought about it, but like kind of the same way as a wrestler, too, he even admitted like he wasn't the best wrestler, but he just knew like if he was the most prepared, if he was in the best shape, you know, he you know, that would be enough to give himself a chance to win. So it's it's kind of one of those things. It's hard to really, you know, um, communicate what I'm trying to say here, but it, it really feels it really came across like angle just had such a good attitude and wouldn't like wouldn't get bent out of shape about, you know, 
you know, losing a match here or there. He just he he just committed to it nonstop, and you know, it, it felt felt like if if he just you know was the best conditioned athlete and just did everything he could, then he would just live with the results. And it's kind of it, it almost felt like it was kind of the same way in the WWE with the the sink or swim mentality. And then the, in 1996, that's when he broke his neck. So they actually do show him breaking his neck. And it looked nasty. It looked just as bad as the Austin thing. So this guy was going to give him like a, like an arm toss or an arm drag. And Angle tried to block it. And then w- when he blocked it, he just fell right on his head. He said he said he heard you know a couple things just break. You know he just heard something snap, and he just kept wrestling through it. And obviously the pain started you know right before the Olympics, and he couldn't get cleared by any doctor. They didn't really go into this depth about the doctor, but eventually he had to find. He actually went to ten different doctors before he found a doctor that would actually clear him, and and they gave him Novocaine. So yeah, it, it is true. Jim Cornette talked about this how he thought that they would only give you Novocaine if it was something for the teeth or a dental issue but no it's true like if you get surgery on your head i've actually had you know um minor surgery on my head uh, a couple different times and they actually do give you novocaine so you don't feel the pain you know you you, you kind of worry about the side effects of novocaine i don't know if there are side effects but uh but yeah novocaine is something that they'll give you uh, just so you don't feel any pain and i think it was at was it at the olympics or yeah it was at the olympic trials the guy actually knew about the uh, neck injury, he was going for the neck, but he, then he opened himself up and Angle was able to take him down by the legs because he kept going for the neck, but it didn't work because Angle was so, so juiced up with the Novocaine that he wouldn't feel any pain anyway. So, And then, you know, the footage from the Olympics. You know, he talked about how really, really good footage here. They, they showed pretty much footage of every match. And Angle was just saying, you know, he didn't have to win pretty just as long as he won. So it wasn't like these were fancy victories. And then the um, the final match against the Iranian, uh, Jadidi, um, it kind of went to a stalemate. You know, it was, it was basically tied at one. And um, it was going to be the referee's decision. And it's funny, the, the Iranian actually... He keeps on holding up his hand. He keeps on forcing up the hand, and maybe that bit him in the ass. And then, uh, surprisingly, he actually held up Angle's hand. And Angle actually hugs the referee. And right there, that just shows you that, you know, with all that stuff with Angle hugging Austin and hugging Vince during the alliance, it was all natural stuff because he hugged the ref back in 96 before he even thought about coming. Uh, to the WWE. So I, I think a lot of Angle's transition was very natural uh, when you do think about it. But um, yeah, I mean, after the Olympics, it, you, you kind of, it was kind of a, it's kind of, he, he reached such a high. And uh, I, I thought Angle was great, you know, when he described uh, the actual gold medal win. You could definitely see the fire still in his eyes when he talked about how unbelievable it was. And it was, it was, it was a hell of an accomplishment. He, he kept on saying, and this is something he always said, he said he was relieved that, he was more relieved than overjoyed because he just knew, like, if he ever wanted to get back to that spot, it's like, you know, you got to wake up at 4 a.m., you got to, you know, stay in the gym until 1.30 at night, you have very little sleep, and just just so draining on the body that he was just so relieved that uh, he was able to do it. But then it's like, then what do you do to make money after that? You know, after the motivational speeches and everything else that he was doing in between 96 and 98, it's like eventually the gold medal kind of wears off after a while. And he turned down the 10 year deal. I guess they gave him the same deal that they gave Mark Henry. Basically, I, I believe it was 250 a year for 10 years. So when you total it up, it ends up being maybe $3 million for 10 years, something along those lines. But Angle <laughs> Angle was, was willing to take the deal as long as he agreed not to lose any matches. And then Vince, Vince just said, well, we'll see you later. And um, it wasn't until he started watching... Well, this is all well-documented stuff, but he said, you know, Stone Cold got his attention. You know, Raw started getting very popular. I think Angle finally started to see the money was really there at at the time. And um, Jim Ross actually said you had to you had to come down and earn it and give him a chance to try out and uh, decided to try out. And when he did try out, he he wanted to quit the first day. And, and his agent said, just stick it out for one day and, and, and then we'll talk about it. Then he stuck it out. Then he came back the next day. But he was just saying, man, it just really hurt. You know, this, this stuff really hurts. He's like, he's in a lot of pain. Uh, he really doesn't enjoy it. So they have, Jim Cornette was saying, 
Jim Cornette actually did review this. He said that they skipped over the stuff in Memphis. I guess there's a lot of footage in Memphis that they could have shown here. That didn't really bother me that much. I think what they showed here was good enough. You kind of get the point. Angle was in a lot of pain. You saw him just taking, you know, very generic bumps, trying to learn. You saw him really stuttering on the mic. Just not a lot of, uh, comf- you know, just not very comfortable in terms of delivering promos at first. But, um... But what I think was really the key here was just to, you know, dress him up in the Olympic outfit, give him the gold medal, give him all these accolades in the background, just have him brag, just have him bragging in these vignettes. And that that's what really worked. Like, it, it even worked with my grandma. I remember uh, this was like in t- late 2001. This was after Angle won uh, the championship a couple of times. So he had already made it. But uh, I think we watched the VHS. It's true. It's true. And and, and I, sh- I showed her the vignettes of Angle just, you know, just kind of bragging about all his accomplishments. And it works. She was like, he's a blowhard. It's like, who did this? Who does this guy think he is? He's full of himself. And so it really worked. It really did. Angle really did come off like this jock that was just really braggadocious and just really cock. I, w- I wouldn't even say cocky. I would just say just just uh, just like in awe of himself. Like there is nothing else but just talking about his accomplishments. So. And, you know, the, the WWE stuff, you know, before we get to the WWE stuff, like one, one of the, um, God, how did, how did I forget to write this in the outline? Uh, the Foxcatcher stuff, uh, you know, the, 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 the Foxcatcher was, was this place, it was like this farm that they could just go and train. So, you know, this guy would actually um, put him on the payroll. I guess a guy like Angle, he would pay him to, uh, guys like Angle and Dave Schultz, he would actually pay them uh, to train the other wrestlers, maybe pay them to just do er- uh, errands on the farm. You actually saw one guy giving uh, John DuPont a haircut. So basically this guy, and I, I watched the 30 for 30 documentary about it, and it's funny, Angle didn't have any sound bites in that documentary. Even in the movie, too. They made a whole movie about this called Foxcatcher. <laughs> you would think because of Angle's uh, accolades, he would have been one of the characters. It just didn't seem like Angle was that big of a part of the thing. Of the thing, you know, It seemed like he would go off and do his own trading and do all these different tournaments. And he would just come back to the farm and train whenever he had downtime. So it just felt to me like Angle wasn't a major player the way Dave Schultz was um, with this thing. And then Mark Schultz as well. He actually got a job uh, at this farm as well. I know it sounds a little bit boring just talking about it here, but this it's a fascinating story because John DuPont, I believe um, his family made a lot of money from gunpowder from the Re- Revolutionary War. So he had all this money passed down to him. And he was always like one of these kids that just never had any friends. So they would actually pay to have like friends come over and they would actually pay friends to go to his birthday party. And it eventually got to the point where he just started putting money into swimming, I think horse riding and then amateur wrestling as well. Like he just, this guy just wanted the win. He put all this money into this uh, Fox catcher wrestling club. Um, but then over time he learned about how he bought a gun to started developing mental health issues. I guess he felt like Dave turned his back on him and he ended up killing Dave. And then, um, you know, Angle asked to be off the payroll after John DuPont killed uh, Dave Schultz. And uh, Angle actually started a new wrestling club with Dave Schultz's wife, Nancy Schultz. And Angle became the first member of that club. You know, they didn't really go too much into depth with it. But um, but yeah, the Fox Catcher story, it's it's just one. It's just another like tragedy that happened uh, before the Olympics. It's just crazy how Angle's father dies. His mentor, Dave Schultz, was another Olympic gold medalist who really was a monumental figure in Angle's life. So he dies as well, and then he breaks his neck. So just everything that Angle went through in the first half of 96, it's just amazing that he was able to persevere uh, and win the gold medal. So, yeah, I mean, just just the, the training, uh, you know, sh- all the footage of Angle working out and all, you know, the, him getting dropped on his neck, this is just really, really good fo- footage. And, uh, you know, my dad was an amateur wrestler. He's kind of weird when it comes to WWE. He'll, he'll love certain guys like Brock, and then he, he, I remember he went on a huge rant about other guys like Shawn Michaels, but he would love uh, this documentary just because of, you know, all the different amateur wrestling, uh, you know, clips and footage that was edit, edited together. They just did a really, really, really good job. Um, so, yeah. And then we get to the WWE stuff. The WWE stuff is very well documented. Um 
you know, they showed Survivor Series 99. Vince told them, you know, the sink or swim and, you know, you don't, you don't boo an Olympic gold medalist. And it was just very natural. It was just very natural stuff. I, I think Angle had a chip on his shoulder because, you know, he was unable to kind of find success with the gold medal before he got to the WWE. So he, in, in a way, he was really promoting amateur wrestling and just kind of felt like the fans were really turning their back on the United States by not supporting him. So I think a lot of Angle's promos initially just had legit, you know, realism and legit heat to them. So it was really, really good stuff. So they showed a lot of, um, you know, interviews from the WWE guys, Rock, Austin, Triple H gave uh, great sound bites. The highlight would be The Rock. The Rock was uh, really good. You know, he, he was... Um, he was very passionate about uh, Angle. He just said that he, he shot off like a missile. He said that he would do all these entertaining stuff, but when it was time for a great match, I will Angle slam the... <laughs> Rock cursed a lot. It's funny. It's almost like just being... Doing all these Disney movies, Rock was able to just to open up and just uh, let it all out of the tank. And, uh, yeah, so so Rock was definitely uh, great there. He even talked about how, you know... He knew Angle would persevere out of the drug problem. And, you know, the, the dark side to fame is, you know, the, you have all these guys uh, doing drugs, uh, drinking, and, and uh, a lot of guys don't come out clean on the other side. And, and, and it kind of got me thinking, like, it's, it's really, you know, you could just tell Rock really misses, you know, that era of wrestling. But you, you almost... It, it kind of just makes it's it's one of the few times where, where it really just makes you feel good. You know, The Rock was able to get out of the business with all that he accomplished, and he was able to get out clean and healthy, and he came off great there. So Austin, Austin really uh, had a really interesting soundbite about um, you know career suicide with the neck injury, about how he was talking to Kurt for like an hour and a half, then Kurt started slurring, and he, he asked Kurt if he was all right, and. He just he just said that, uh, you know, Angle was just one of these guys that would just do anything just to put on a great performance. And then it kind of, you know, bit him in the ass towards the end. And Triple H was great, too. He talked about how Kurt had him and Kurt had just natural chemistry. Uh, the the most interesting soundbite that Triple H gave was about Vince. I, I think it had to do with the uh, drug addiction, the pill addiction. Uh, it, it just just mentioned how once once you cross a certain line with Vince, that's when he gets pissed off. So that was really interesting. Uh, you know, when the, when they showed a lot of the WWE stuff, I mean, it, it's it, it it just looks amazing. I mean, when when you look back at how Kurt looked at that time. Everything just looked so amazing. You know, just the, they showed a ton of moonsaults. I don't know if the director for A&E said, just show, keep showing moonsaults. Like they show, they must have shown like every single Kurt Angle moonsault from a pay-per-view view there. And I got to say the rock feud the, for, for whatever reason, it, it, like if, if you didn't know Kurt Angle's career and you were just like a, a casual A&E fan, you might've came into this thing thinking that Kurt Angle and the rock was probably the best feud that Angle ever had. It just, what they used here just came off so great. And rock had a great soundbite where he said, you're not facing the Romanians. You're not facing the Bulgarians. You're facing the rock. And there was even another clip that they showed with, uh, rock saying he's going to take those gold medals and stuff and right up your Olympic ass. And it, it just came off so great. Uh, whatever the rock said there. So, so yeah, I mean, they show all, you know, they, they show, uh, angle winning all these different titles and, and, uh, but, but, but then, but then obviously you see all these bumps and all these, uh, matches, they just took its toll on him. And they showed the Brock Lesnar, no way out bump where, you know, angle is on angles, giving Brock, he has him in a headlock. Brock actually starts running with him and then just dumps him right into the turnbuckle. And that's where Angle, uh, you know, re-injures re his neck, uh, to be exact. So Angle already had these neck problems, you know, going into the WWE, but they weren't really aggravated until you get to WrestleMania 19. I mean, it, it's funny. Like, it's very similar to Austin in terms of, you know, getting dropped on his head. I mean, there, there is, <sighs> there is a good chance that Angle probably would have hurt his neck anyway, just because if you look at you know all the matches he had with Chris Benoit with him doing German suplexes, it probably would have happened anyway. But it probably wouldn't have been this bad. Like I remember, Doctor Youngblood was able to, you know, he told Kurt, he said, "You have the worst neck I've seen." right next to Stone Cold Steve Austin. So obviously the Owen spot and then the 
the Olympic trial spot where he lands on his head had a lot to do with it. Uh, but yeah, I, I would definitely say there's a good chance that Angle probably would have broke his neck anyway. It just wouldn't have been, it just probably wouldn't have been as bad as, uh, you know, Austin's uh, uh, situation. It might, it might have been along the lines of Edge and, and Benoit uh, where, where, you know, it doesn't take like, it, it hurt their careers, but it didn't, it, 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 it probably wouldn't have caused him, uh, you know, someone like Austin to retire if he didn't have like that uh that Owen Hart pile driver bump. And then the WrestleMania nineteen, the tough decision at the time where uh they really went into depth about how uh Angle w- was not gonna wrestle and then this kid they actually showed the kid uh came over his house and showed him the direct T V cover of him and uh Brock Lesnar on the cover. I always thought it was just Kurt and Brock on the cover, but it's that WrestleMania nineteen poster where Kurt and Brock are at the forefront of it, but there's still like a million guys in the background. But after Angle saw that, he was just like, man, I got to, this is never going to happen again. I've, I've got to wrestle through WrestleMania. And, you know, maybe that was the wrong decision. Maybe looking back on it, maybe it was just too much. And, um, you know, Ang- I know a lot of people will come, come forth and just say that, you know, Angle got the wrong surgery. He should have gotten the... Um, Dr. Youngblood surgery, this the, the neck fusion surgery, you know, because that way you could take a whole year off. But, you know, the, the neck fusion thing, it's that's tough to come back from as well. I mean, look, Edge's comeback was temporary. Um, Austin's comeback was, you know, by the time you get to the summer of 2002, that was starting to nag at him. And who knows, like, what kind of pain Benoit was in when you get to 2007. I'm Because, you know, Angle was saying that when you fuse your neck, you're stretching out the rest of the neck that isn't fused. So you're putting more damage and more torque on the actual neck because of the fusion. He said that the the miracle fusion, the non-invasive neck surgery, was really the right decision. It really gave himself long-term health. I I just think the mistake that Angle made uh, with the Dr. Joe surgery, I I think it probably was the right way to go, but, but I don't see why he had to rush back. Like it almost felt too good to be true. It's like you know Ben. You saw Ben want to take thirteen months off between King of the Ring and Vengeance two thousand two, and then Angle is in the ring in June of two thousand three, taking belly to bellies from in Germans from Charlie Haas. It's just like it's just why did you come back so soon? Um, and I just think a lot of it just has to do with money. It's like if you, you know you get in that downside guarantee. I just in situations like that, you just wish some of these wrestlers were a little bit more taken care of, and you know maybe guarantee money would have solved that problem with guys just rushing back. Um, but yeah, like in retrospect, if I could, if I if I was angling, I could go back in time. I think you get the Doctor Joe surgery. Uh, the guy in Pittsburgh, the minimally invasive surgery, and then you come back maybe at Survivor Series. Give yourself like six months off, let it heal, and then um, and then get back at it. But it was just mistake after mistake. You have Brock hitting him with a chair. You know, you're taking that DDT from Eddie Guerrero, and you know the neck was going to constantly keep breaking. Um, so, and then where do we go from here? So Angle. Oh yeah, they also show this footage of Angle being doped out. Uh, there's like this WrestleMania 22 buildup where it's him, Mysterio, and Orton. And uh, the, the really interesting shots here of Angle just kind of dozing off. Uh, I don't know if he just took some pills or maybe he was fantasizing about taking pills. But yeah, it just, it just did not look good. Mark Henry, I guess this was around the time he was feuding with Mark Henry. Mark Henry even told him, he's like, don't let people see you like that. You're Kurt Angle, man. You, you're... you're, you're you're a hell of an athlete. You don't, you don't, you don't, people don't need to see you like that. So Vince Saxe tells him to go to rehab or leave. All right. So th- this is one of the weaker parts of the documentary. I-, I-, I think they should have had Vince on this part of the documentary because uh, the original story was Vince told him he wanted him to go to rehab and w- stay on the road at the same time. And Angle said, no, I want you to pay for me to go to rehab. Let me take time off and then I'll come back. And Vince told him, "You're an Olympic gold medalist. You're not like these other losers in the in the dressing room. So you don't you don't you know you don't have to take time off and go to rehab. You you can do it. And I don't know. I just think at the time Vince was a little bit more strict. You know, maybe he didn't want to open Pandora's box and have wrestlers start taking time off. You know, whenever they wanted. You know, maybe that was the philosophy behind that. But I think in in retrospect, you make an exception for the guy that risked paralysis." In the main event of WrestleMania, the 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 the, the show that you helped make uh, WrestleMania, you know Vince's baby. I mean, I I think Vince owed it to Angle, you know, to let him go to rehab 
and uh, get him off the road. So, so he he said to him, "I don't want a, a a lot of it just had to do with Eddie Guerrero." When you look back on it, he said to him, "You know, I don't want to have a dead Olympic gold medalist on my hands." And that's that was definitely triggered by the wellness policy and you know the side effect of Eddie Guerrero's death. And it's funny, like when I look back on it now, if Eddie never died. You know, maybe there's a good chance that Angle dies before Eddie and Chris Benoit. I never really thought of it like that. But when you hear about that conversation and you you, you look at, you know, the side effects of uh, Eddie Guerrero dying and the wellness policy, now they're starting to test guys for pills and steroids. Yeah, it was it's, it's probably a direct side effect of, uh, you know, Eddie Guerrero's death. So they totally shitted on TNA. Jim Ross actually called it a debacle of a run. Austin said, you know, TNA, what? They're not on our level. But at the time, when you look at it from a talent standpoint, TNA probably had, uh, you know, better talent than WWE at the time. I thought WWE hit a really dark place at the end of 2006. And by the way, it's like, you know, you want to throw shots at TNA, but when you look at the amount of business that TNA did in the fourth quarter of 2006, when you add up all the, the pay-per-views, they, they topped, they probably topped No Mercy and Cyber Sunday of 2006. So for a company like TNA, that's not even on the same level as AEW in terms of funding. I think that's a hell of an accomplishment. So they tried to downplay uh, TNA as a company, but that kind of that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I don't think they give TNA enough credit. I think when you look at Angle's run in TNA, it was really good at the beginning. Like I really felt like Angle was great in the ring, even though he was on pills and you know maybe he was drinking a little bit. It wasn't until like 2013 when he was on the way out where the DUI started. I mean, they show clips of Angle just looking a little bit, you know, just not in the best of shape. They they show him just looking you know, not in the best of spirits. And um, they kind of used this as the footage to show that Angle was mixing pills and liquor in TNA, that he was complacent in TNA. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, like I said, guys, the DUIs were actually at the, I think it was like in 2013. At that time, people had already given up on, on TNA. And, yeah, I, I'll give uh, the, his wife, Giovanna, a lot of credit. His wife was very strict about Angle, um, you know, staying off of these pills. He, like the, the wake up call was either you get off of these pills and, you know, stop these, um, you know, arrest and DUI stops or, or we're done. And uh, I, I believe it was Angle. And yeah, they weren't going to let Angle in the Hall of Fame. You know, in 2014, there were rumors about what he was going to do when he was a free agent. But. You know, he still had a ways to go and his agent told him you got to go to rehab and you know he, he really said that rehab was a bitch But it did pay off. He said it was like the worst thing he'd ever done You know, it was it was really like he wished he was dead and it tells you I'll tell you what man It, it makes you never want to uh, Think about taking pills and I'm I've been you know I, Obviously, I'm, there's no reason for me to take painkillers, but obviously it just it, it just it just makes you wish like you don't want to put anything into your body that's going to make you you know i'm already like addicted to coffee and so i don't want to get addicted to anything else not cigarettes not pills not alcohol so yeah it, it just really makes you appreciate you know how tough that was just going to rehab he, he he just said it was it was the hardest thing he'd ever done but you know once you get out of it though you just can't go back. And I think when he tore his ACL, he wanted to take some more painkillers just to get through it. And Giovanna was... Re so you got to give Giovanna credit. Like, she was really strict. And she just said, no. It's like, you know, you're not going to fuck this up. You're not going to... We're not going to go back to, you know, what happened before. So, yeah. Got to give her credit, you know. I, I always think it kind of raises a red flag when you see these younger girls, you know, marrying these older guys. And I went through it, too, with my father. But... You know, you got to give Giovanna credit, though. She came across uh, very genuine and very strong in a lot of these uh, a lot of these sound bites. Um, yeah. So overall, I'll, I'll end it here. I just think the documentary should have been on a, a, a bigger platform. You know, I, I mean, to compare it to The Last Dance, I mean, I think Angle, Angle and Michael Jordan. I mean, I, I, I do see a lot of similarities there. I, I think the, the competitive drive. Um, you know, they're, they're both great athletes. 
Um, so yeah, you could see some similarities, but to, to act like ESPN should have made this a 10 part series, maybe that's asking for a little bit too much, but I, I definitely think it, I just hate the fact that they just threw this into the A and E series where Undertaker and Goldberg actually got better ratings than this. That kind of, you know, rubs me the wrong way, but Hey, you know, I, I, I think it, it's the proof is in the pudding, you know, the ROH stuff doesn't get a lot of attention and it kind of go, it kind of ties in where just a lot of people just don't really appreciate uh, great wrestling. And I think the same could really be said for Kurt Angle. I just don't think enough people really appreciate, you know, how great this guy has been, you know, over his career. So, yeah, I, I, I do wish it had been uh, better promoted. I, I wish it wasn't part of the A&E, A&E series. I wish this would get a Blu-ray release. And I, I just wish they had, you know, done more. Um for what they did here, I thought it was cool, but you know this this could have been really in depth, really comprehensive. With uh, you know they they really could have broken this down, and I know the Chris Benoit stuff is a little bit too early to do that, but you could have done you know five to ten minutes on Austin Rock, Triple H, uh, Eddie Guerrero, Rey Mysterio. You could have done so much more. You, you, even with Jeff Jarrett and Samoa Joe and. AJ Styles at the disposal while they were filming this thing. They could have done a lot more with the TNA stuff. This could have been, uh, you know, beyond epic and uh, throw it in with an anthology on Blu-ray. I would have gave them like 50 bucks uh, just to have a copy of this. So, yeah, I mean, it was cool. The amateur wrestling stuff was was awesome, but I'm not going to lie. It, it, it could have been a, it could have been a lot better.